Well, welcome to this After the Homily Aid, a Lenten resource for the first Sunday of Lent. I wanted to do a little teaching on, again, temptation. I touched on it briefly during the homily, but I'm using a resource for this teaching called On the Way to Jesus Christ by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, a.k.a. Pope uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, And it's a wonderful book that has a lot of insights into this particular situation in the scriptures. So we'll just dive right in. One of the first things we recognize is that everything Jesus did, he did to help us and teach us. Um, he's showing us in the situation how to fight off temptation. So we need to pay close attention to what he uses and how he responds to each particular temptation from the devil. In the 40 days of Jesus' fast in the desert, recall first the 40 days that Moses spent fasting on Mount Sinai. Jesus is the new Moses who goes to the mountaintop and dialogues with the Father and then comes back and shares everything with us. And indeed, the letter to the Hebrews is quite emphatic in stating that Jesus can sympathize with us because he was tempted in every respect as we are, although, of course, he did not sin. Being tempted is an essential part of his being a man, part of his descent into fellowship with us into the depths of our need. And now we want to examine the core of all temptation. The germ of all temptation is setting God aside so that he seems to be a secondary concern when compared with all the urgent priorities of our lives. To consider ourselves the needs and desires of the moment to be more important than he is, that is the temptation that always besets us. For in doing so, we deny God his divinity, and we make ourselves, or rather, the powers that threaten us into our God. That is the core of all temptation, it is not placing first you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength and being. And so putting our faith aside and thinking that other things are more important is kind of the core rebellion that we face uh, in this world. Now we're going to examine the first temptation. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. That is mockery, but at the same time a challenge. Christ should go about proving his claim if he is to be believed. This demand for proof runs through the entire story of Jesus' life. Over and over again he encounters the reproach that he has not proved himself sufficiently, that he still must perform the great miracle that will remove all ambiguity and disagreement and make it clear to everyone beyond dispute who and what he is or is not. And we make the same demand of God and Christ and his church throughout the course of history. If you exist, God, then you will have to show yourself. You will have to part the clouds that conceal you and give us the clarity that we deserve. If you, Christ, are really the Son and not just one of those enlightened individuals who keep appearing in the course of history, then you will have to demonstrate it more clearly than you're doing now. And if the church is really supposed to be yours, then you will have to make her a little more unequivocal than she is, is, is in actuality. And just think about this as well, you know, when we try to prove ourselves to other people, we often get into very, you know, degrading behavior because we're trying to prove ourselves to another person. Jesus was, operated constantly under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He never had an identity crisis. He knew who he was. And so he doesn't have to prove himself to people and demonstrate his power. And so that's a great sign for us, too, is that if we're really secure in our relationship with the Lord and we recognize that our Heavenly Father loves us and sent the Holy Spirit, a spirit of adoption, then we're not going to have to prove ourselves to people and always correct things or you know, wrong impressions and just constantly be like a dog chasing his tail uh, and so forth. Did not Does not the Redeemer of the world have to prove himself by giving everyone something to eat. Is this not the problem of feeding the world, and more generally, are not social issues the primary and real standard by which redemption is to be measured? Can anyone rightly be called a redeemer who is not up to this standard? Marxism, quite understandably, made precisely this the core of its self evic promise. It would make sure that all hunger would end and that the desert would, would become bread. If you are the Son of God, what a challenge. And should we not say the same thing to the church? If you want to be the church of God, then you should be constant, concerned first and foremost with bread for the world, the rest comes afterward. It is difficult to respond to this challenge precisely because the cry of the hungry penetrates so deeply into the ears and into the soul as well as it should. Jesus' answer could not be understood 
from the temptation story alone. So we're not just about physical needs. He's showing us in this temptation and withstanding it that there's something more important than just being a, um, an animal and just getting your basic needs at any cost, you know, and denying yourself or compromising who you are. So this is not this criteria, of course. People just look at the church as a social institution that does social justice, and there's no importance anymore to prayer or faith. That's why people don't go to Mass every Sunday. They don't think, see how that fixes the world or makes it a more hospitable place. And so this is a great temptation many people are falling into today, is just to make the church a social institution and to forget, as John Paul II said, that the greatest suffering of all is the loss of eternal life. So now the Holy Father is going to give us an insight into this and why this Jesus does this in the right order. Why is something done now that why is something done now that was previously rejected as a temptation? The people have come to hear God's word and have left everything else behind in order to do so. And therefore they can receive the bread in the right way as people who have opened their hearts to God and to one another. Therefore this miracle of the loaves, this is what he's addressing here, has three components. It is preceded by the search for God, for his word, for proper guidance in all departments of life. Furthermore, the bread is obtained from God by prayer. And finally, the willingness to share with one another is an essential element of the miracle. Listening to God becomes living with God, and it leads from faith to charity, to the discovery of one's neighbor. Jesus is not indifferent to the hunger of mankind, to its bodily needs, but he puts it in the right context and assigns to it the right priority. So when he did the miracle of the loaves, he first instructed them and taught them, and it led to their hearts being softened and sharing and so forth. So he's showing here that we always have to put God first, no matter what. And I'm going to have a slide next of, by an incredible witness. It was a, a Jesuit who was um, executed in the concentration camp in, during World War II, and he was starved to death and then hung, you know, and here's what he says. Bread is important. Freedom is more important. But most important is unfailing worship. Now, here's a man who got the order right. You know, amazing. Now we move on to the second temptation. The devil proves to be a connoisseur of the Bible who knows how to quote the, the psalm exactly. The whole conversation of the second temptation takes the form of a dispute between two scripture scholars. Joachim Nelka comments that the devil makes his appearance as a theologian. Solovev took up this theme in the short story about the Antichrist. The Antichrist receives an honorary doctorate in theology from the University of Tübingen. When theology becomes mere knowledge about biblical texts and about the history of the Christian faith, but it is not associated with other existential decisions, then it does not serve faith but destroys it. The theological disputation between Christ and the devil is an argument about the correct interpretation of Scripture. The standard for evaluating this is not found in merely historical data. The real question is, with what image of God do we read Scripture? The dispute about the interpretation is a dispute about who God is. A sentence from the story about the Antichrist shows what is ultimately at stake. He, he that is the Antichrist, believed in God. But in the depths of his soul, he preferred himself to him. In the story of the temptations, the dispute is chiefly about Scripture, but it is also a dispute about whether the old really belongs to Christ, whether he is really the answer to its promises. He, the poor man, the powerless failure, the one on the cross who was not protected by God, the man who did not bring about the general welfare that, that the Antichrist creates, is he really the one who is to come? The struggle about Scripture is, as we have said, a struggle about the image of God. But the decisive moment of this struggle occurs over the image of Jesus Christ. Is he who remained without any worldly power really the Son of the living God? The battle for the Bible, this battle for God and Jesus Christ, must always be waged anew. And so, you know, the, the Scriptures warn us as well in First Timothy 1 that there are people that want to be teachers, but they teach their doubt and speculation rather than the plan of God to be received by faith. And so we had this whole Jesus seminar movement where people are trying to find out what Jesus really said and what he didn't. And they have so little faith, they just actually back themselves in a corner and really believe in nothing. And he's a mythical figure now. Even Rudolf Bultmann, the great um, Lutheran theologian who brought in the whole historical critical method kind of and went overboard with it, 
you know, well, it's a nice story. You know, the dogs probably ate up his body or something. I don't really believe in the resurrection, but it's a nice story. He actually, that's what he was quoted as saying that. So, but he was very knowledgeable about scripture. So the very fact that Satan can quote scripture should make us suspicious just because somebody's a scholar. It doesn't mean they're a man of, or woman of faith. So we're always looking for who do you say that I am? And they should be able always to say that Jesus Christ is Lord or they're not worth their money. What is at stake here again in the second temptation is what we've already alluded to. God must submit to an examination. He's tested the way products are for, products are for quality control. He has to subject himself to certain conditions that we declare to be necessary if we're going to be sure. Now, if he does not grant the protection promised in Psalm 90, then he is just not God. Then he has falsified his own word and himself with it. The whole big question of how we can know God and how we cannot know him of how man is related to God and how he can lose him confronts us here. The arrogance that wants to make God into an object and tries to impose our laboratory conditions upon him cannot find God, for it already presupposes that we can deny God as God because we are placing ourselves above him because we do away with the entire dimension of love, of interior listening, and recognize as real only that which is empirical, what we can manipulate. Someone who thinks this way makes himself God and thereby abases not only God, but also the world and himself. From this scene on the pinnacle of the temple, it is also possible, though, to get a view of the cross. Christ did not cast himself down from the pinnacle of the temple. He did not jump from the heights. He did not put God to the test. But he did descend into the abyss of death, into the night of abandonment, into the desolation of those who are helpless. He ventured to make this leap as an act of God's love for men, and therefore he knew that ultimately in this leap he could only fall into the kindly hands of the Father. And so the real meaning of Psalm 90 or 91 appears the right to, to that ultimate and unlimited trust about which it speaks. Someone who obeys God, God's will knows that in all the horrors he may experience, he does not lose a final refuge. He knows that the foundation of the world is love, and that therefore, even in a situation where no man is able or willing to help him, he can still continue walking in confidence toward the one who loves him. Such confidence which Scripture encourages us to have, and to which the risen Lord invites us, is something quite different, however, from the reckless defiance of God that would make God into our servant. What a beautiful insight. You know, it's that confidence is secured by faith and in God's grace that no matter what happens, I am a child of God, I belong to Jesus Christ, and he will ultimately protect me from the wickedness and snares of the devil, and I can go and have eternal life with him. So Jesus, but, it, but it, again, it's a contradiction, power and weakness. You know, that's why Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 12. Now we move on to the third temptation. Jesus' kingdom grows through the humility of the proclamation in those who allow themselves to be made his disciples, who are baptized in the name of the triune God and keep his commandments. And I shared in the homily that humility is the greatest weapon we have. The awareness of our own weakness allows us to call upon and be more dependent upon grace and upon the Lord. Satan's kingdom is illusory and, disintegr and disintegrates. The grave temptation of equating the kingdom of God with the political factor repeats itself over and over again. And we see this especially with the choice of Barabbas over Jesus. He was a, a revolutionary who was ordered to murder, and when it came time to pick who do you want to release, they chose Barabbas. And think about how many people, Catholics or Christians, who put more faith into politics and politicians and will argue and debate and cause great divisions in the church, but won't ever talk lovingly about Jesus as their Lord and Savior, because they really don't believe that's the answer. It's, you know, getting this certain person in office or, or something. I remember when John Kerry was running, they had a website called Catholics for Kerry, and I posted some things on there, and they finally kicked me off <laughs> because I was challenging that they're putting politics above their faith, and they're not putting God first, and they didn't like that, so I got removed. Here's some more insights on the third temptation. The power of God works quietly in the world without raising a hue and cry. Not only the incident of the temptations, but the entire story of Jesus demonstrates this. But it is the real and lasting power. Again and again, God's cause seems to be in a flight to the death. Yet over and over again, it proves to be the thing that truly endures and saves. All the kingdoms of the world that Satan was able to show to the Lord back then have long since vanished. 
Their glory, their doxa, that's the Greek word, proved to be illusory. But the glory of Christ, the humble and self-sacrificial glory of his love, has not perished. In the fight against Satan, Christ remained the victor. Angels came and ministered to him, says the evangelist. The holy year invites us to discover this victory of his, his abiding glory, and to allow ourselves to be led by it in our everyday decisions. So we're going to talk about some modern-day scenarios based on these teachings. We have temptations in our everyday lives. The devil is ruthless, and uh, he doesn't back off when we're having a bad day or we're really down and out. That's precisely when he, he just attacks us the most, and it's unbelievable um, how he, he never gives up. You know, it's like he's always testing the perimeter to see if he can find a weak point or entry. So we can never let our guard down. We have to constantly be fighting the good fight and keeping tabs on resentment, on sin in our life, and on staying really close to Jesus Christ. Our physical health, our emotional state, our timing. Um, I remember sitting down with somebody I used to do spiritual direction with, and his mother was dying, and he was devastated, obviously, that this was happening. He was praying the rosary, and all of a sudden his mother just started cursing at him and saying the most hateful things you could possibly imagine. And and he, he was convinced this was the devil trying to get him to stop praying for her soul at that time, but he was just overwhelmed that, wow, my mom's dying and you're attacking me now? Absolutely, absolutely. I got a, a huge attack in the hospital when I was in the ICU and all these medical things were going wrong. It was the lowest point, I think, of my life. But the Lord came and broke through and got me through it. So don't expect to be let off the hook when you're having a hard time or a struggle. That's precisely when you need to spend more time praying and fortifying the weak spots in your fortress. We also have to grow in discernment. And this is where I was sharing in the homily about we're really in bad shape as a church because there's so few people that teach about spiritual warfare and temptation because so many people have lost faith and don't even believe in the devil. It wasn't even taught in the seminary. And I had a, a professor call into question that the church has actually made any definitive statement about the existence of Satan. What a scandalous thing. In our fourth year theology class, this person said that. So we have to grow in discernment. And, and the more we understand how he works and we understand ourselves and our fears, the more we can fight him off. And then everything comes down to trust. You know, do I trust God or will I take the bait from the enemy and sell out for a falsehood and the misery of power apart from God? That's always the, the offer is here's an easier solution then turning back into your duty and fixing this and trusting in God and rolling up your sleeves, he will always provide some kind of apparent easy way out that's going to bring instant gratification, but it doesn't work. It's false. It's a lie. The temptation to be successful rather than the faithful. So we have to be able to understand that um, the more we fight off temptation and we're successful, then the enemy will leave us alone in that area and he'll try to find another one. So there is progress and... Um, Again, humility is the best thing to help us out, right? So we want to make sure we're humble and we're trusting in the Lord with everything we have. Thank you for tuning in. I'll have another aid um, on the third Sunday of Lent. I will be gone next weekend at the Religious Education Congress in Anaheim.